Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we have a look at the 1993 film The Bride with White Hair 2. This is episode 388, but it's actually one of the rare times when we do uh, two movies in a row that could very easily have been one episode. Like 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 last summer, I think it was, we did uh, both The Spider's Web and Castle of Terror, which are the same movie made twice. And this is... This is not quite that. It's not a remake of the same film, but it's a movie that got released like just a few months after the first film. So they're essentially one big film. Two. And it's part two. Uh, so so I think you can listen to these episodes together. We will try to go easy on you, the listener, so that, so that you, know, you know, we're not necessarily covering all the same stuff again. But uh, I'm really glad that we're talking about this movie. Okay. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's film, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror Anthology and a lot of really great stuff coming up, including a novel from uh, Rain Knox, who just happens, and I mean, this is this is completely coincidental, happens to be the wife of Tony Salvaggio. And I've been, I've we've got her novel, Animal Charmer, coming up in february and already we were tiktoking about it and people are loving the the previews and i i i'm just so excited about this release so lots of stuff coming up from from uh, castle bridge media uh with you from austin it's tony Savaggio, lead singer and bass of the band deserts of mars and lead guitarist of the band rise from fire say hello tony howdy howdy um yes and i'm sure that you've been hearing about this uh about the novel i mean i'm i'm yeah. stoked about it yeah rain's right and so much stuff right now it's hard to it's, keep up it, it it i i loved reading it i mean you know i i really fought for this book so okay uh also in austin mr drew edwards is the writer creator of the long-running underground comic halloween man which you can find at global comics he is a best writer ringo nominee austin chronicle best of austin award winner and a member of the pen america fellowship say hello drew I am trying to also avoid using my kung fu because I don't want the poison to take my life. I, <laughs> it happens. I, 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 we're going to talk about the rules of wuxia kung fu in the in these movies. Uh, and finally, also in Denver, um, socialite just spun in from a, from a party. A and, ladies' uh, potluck. A ladies' potluck where she was, I guess, <laughs> you know, potlucking and kibitzing and gossiping and whatever it is that one does no. at a ladies' potluck. Um, we, do not throw, we do not throw pillows at each other. I like that, that you assume that <laughs> instead of forming a nickel to fight the evil <laughs> men. Like we just watched this, and you're like, "Oh, they they're you know gossiping is not or, yeah somebody's <laughs> on a throne like you know ready to to dispatch yes. with the eight other eight clans." See, I'm yes. I'm always suspecting that. That yeah. sounds so much cooler. That's right. Well, maybe that's what the potlucks are all about. In fact, you know, um, you never know. So that is Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration in Denver. Uh, yes, say hello. I know you've already we've already heard your voice, but but hi. Uh, okay, this week, as I said, Bride with White Hair two. It's a 1993 Hong Kong film directed by David Wu. It is the sequel to Bride with White Hair with Brigitte Lin and Leslie Chung rep- reprising their roles as Lian Ni Chung and Sh- Cho Yi Hong. Uh, this is uh, loosely based on the 1957 novel, The Romance of the White-Haired Maiden. The first movie actually kind of covers the beats of that novel. Um, that novel ended with Cho Yi Hung taking to the mountains to guard the flower in hopes that he would someday be able to, to uh, heal his, uh, his heart and his lover. Um, this movie gives us a sequel to that, and it goes wild. So um let's get our opening thoughts uh as as if you haven't listened to last week's episode you should go listen to bride with white hair one but here we are uh opening thoughts let's go drew tony julia and then i'll go drew what are your thoughts uh so i feel like this movie in a lot of respects while i do think is a bit of a step down from the first one um in many respects i do think it is the movie that you when you hear the title the bride with white hair like the bride with white hair is all over this movie it's 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 basically a monster movie and she's the monster and um you know like 
Whereas like the title character doesn't really become the title character in the first movie until like the last bit mm -hmm. of that film um i found this movie very interesting um and in fact you know while watching it speaking of monster movies like the the um the thing that i was really struck by is how similar it was to a lot of the lesbian vampire movies we've mm -hmm. watched and th there's also sort of that um whether intentionally or not um that sort of like ho homosexual panic you know into it whereas like you know a lot of the the drive of the the male characters and some of the female characters uh is well you know these women are out of control how do we how do we get them back under control again mm. you know how do we how do we exert our our patriarchal rights again and mm. I, i'm not necessarily even saying that this was intentional on behalf of the filmmakers it's just that the, i found <laughs> the similarities between this movie and western uh vampire you know Western vampire films, particularly ones with with you know queer undertones, mm -hmm. very very intriguing. Um, so you know, and I'm sure that's something we'll probably come back to as we we dig more into the movie. But I I, I that was my my first and foremost main takeaway of this, and the thing that I found most intriguing about it. Well, I, I, I'm going to respond to that because I think that's actually going to be one of our topics and it's a really, really interesting angle. So, so thank you for, for bringing, bringing up this question of, uh, is this sort of a Chinese lesbian vampire movie? And, and what does that mean? Tony, what are your opening thoughts? I, I think I, I don't like it as much as part one. Um, I especially like the presentation on this one. I was watching it digitally on Amazon. Um, the subtitles, I'm so used to the old style kind of golden harvest subtitles. What does that mean? They're really so kind of more about it. Like, um, just it's neat to see these are new digital subtitles. Like the font mm. is kind of nice and they're not burned in, but I think the quality of the translation Mm. feels like old school golden harvest translation yeah, it's definitely not great quality it yeah i think it wasn't as good as the previous one the action sequences also i couldn't tell if it's just digital i think it's somewhere in between the way that it's shot with this kind of slow-mo and lots of blur blur yeah um i prefer the how the previous action scenes were shot in the first mm -hmm. one a little bit less of that. Um, also, I'd forgotten this. It's been a long time since I've seen this, longer than I thought, because mm. I've forgotten some of the bits, but it's a lot more mean-spirited to its heroes mm. than the first one. I mean, nobody is, almost no one's safe. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's it's really tragic, and I'm kind of used to that in martial arts movies, but not at the body count that this one has by the end. Mm. Um, I think it's still a cool movie, but I didn't enjoy... Like, it's just got such a different vibe. I kind of wish that it could have kept just filmed back to back by the same people. Yes. Um, it could have easily, you know, in the way it's interesting in, in the way it tells the story, because I think Drew's right that it feels like, you know, where you would kind of go, perhaps. But it could it also would have made a great miniseries, like taking these two and really expanding on the themes and the characters uh, yeah. would have been great. At, during this time, you know, uh, that would have been interesting. Had we gotten a 1993 miniseries of Bride with White Hair, that would have been cool. Uh, I still like it. And there's some great characters. Like, the character of Moon is just awesome. She's so good. She's just, I, I really like her. Um, and then, you know, I, the cult is really interesting. Um, and they are ruthless. But I, I just, it's not as good. A lot of the things I liked about the first one, this one doesn't quite capture that. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. It's just it, it. I I like the way the previous one was. You know, even even the cinematography I prefer. There, and there's similarities still, but it has a it has a different vibe. Yeah. And when you see this, when when you see flashbacks of which there are many, you can see the difference in vibe, and that is its own kind of thing. That's it. That's really interesting. And and, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, we should we should mention that Ronnie Yu was the director of the first bride with white hair merely months earlier and he remains a 
screenwriter here and uh, director, um, but uh, or no, I'm sorry, producer. But he's he's not the director of uh, of Bride with White Hair. Too. Who knows why? You know, it, maybe there was just too much. This is a big undertaking to to create what sure. amounts to uh, you know a five or five hour film in one year. So obviously he handed off directing duties to somebody else um, and stuck around as the writer and director. Um, I'm a writer and producer. Anyway, um, yes, thank you. Uh, all right, Julia, what about you? Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said, although I didn't get the whole um, gay panic thing that Drew was referring to. I I felt like it's actually pretty, uh, because of the fact that there's so much gender fluidity and like so much um, homosexuality in them, it just, you know, undertones mostly. But in the films, I kind of thought that it was more like, it's all good, whatever. Like, I, I didn't feel like it was kind of saying, you know, oh, this is, this is frightening that these people are. But I don't know, but that because I just think it's kind of everywhere. Like I didn't feel like it was just in the villains, you know. It's kind of just all over. But um, that's just my perception. But uh, I thought it was really um, uh, neat looking again. Same thing with the colors, as I said for last film, which is just mm. that the, I just love that every single scene has a different color theme, and it's just one one color that's really just um, pervading everything in that scene, and it's different color from scene to scene. Um, like the so red, like yellow the, or blue. Or well, the blue red blue. for the wedding was just so beautiful. Anyway, yeah. um, there was so many neat things like that. I was not a fan of the weird hair weapon, but I know Jason really liked it. So whatever. Yeah. The fact that that uh, Lian uh, Nishang uses uh, her hair to uh, the bride, you know, uses her hair to, to like kill people. It's interesting. It's different. I just didn't really like it that much. But um, a lot of violence, a lot of a lot of gore. Um, I loved the character of Moon. I thought she was really cool, really, really interesting character also. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, the captions were a bit distracting because every once in a while I'd just be like, what? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, uh, what, what Tony said is right, you know, where a, a lot of the captions clearly are, you know, they're close and, and the, if if you're like doing a really expensive job, you'll go through and then hire yet another writer to take the raw translation that's been done by this excellent Chinese speaker, and that this new writer will go through and then just turn it into like beautiful English. Well, and that did not happen here, you know. No, clearly. and in fact, there's there's just some kind of mistakes. And having seen a couple of different uh, subtitled versions, yes, you can kind of see. There's also I wish I had examples. I should have done. Uh, call back through some of my older movies but a lot of times when i say that kind of golden harvest translation stuff it's and those are pretty good but they became kind of a a trope because you're more likely to get subtitled screen you know i would you would see them in the theater more often or 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 you know once streaming happened um but there you'll get you know a lot of translators say translation should always also be localization and i tend to kind of agree with that that you know, contextually, especially, uh, you know, uh, in China and Japan, there's a lot of context stuff that that is be, trying to be conveyed. Yeah. And I think you do kind of need to localize that. But you'll often see this. You'll, you'll see if you watch enough stuff from like the 80s to the early 90s, like mid 80s to early 90s, you'll mm. see translations where synonyms, like synonyms for things will show up a lot. Like, mm-hmm. but it'll always be kind of a more flowery or like, you could tell somebody kind of had it in a dictionary. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And... It's like a Google Translate kind of thing. So yeah, sort but, of. But before yeah, Google yeah. Translate, so you're just kind yeah. of like, it's somebody doing their best, really, but they yeah. don't necessarily know if one word makes more sense than another. Sure, I'll absolutely. give you an example. I don't remember what... The the clearest thing that I remembered from watching Bride with White Hair 2, uh, you know, 20 years ago, was the phrase, they all, all of the women in the gang, because in this one, um, the, the witch has formed her own death cult. And what they do is, is uh, they, they seek justice for women. They kidnap women into their cult and they kill, kill men and they have a slogan. And their slogan in the version I saw 20 years ago was very simple. It was men. I see one, I kill one. That's right. the and phrase. In this one, it's more like if, if someone's, if a man is in front of you or something like it's very it's, oblique and, yeah. and, and it's not clear. Um, it was so much better when somebody... although that, that 
that that's actually not true to what they do because they also enslave men too. That's right. Yeah. They do in in one of the few running comedic bits in this movie. Uh, they have men slaves who do physical stuff for them, like massages, and one presumes maybe even sexual favors. We don't see that, but uh, massages and and manual labor. But the women are constantly killing them because they lose patience with them, which I think is hilarious. I, it's it, that. That is funny. The, they're like they're... the henchmen of a really yes. bad, uh, like, <laughs> like a really terrible despot. You know? Yeah. So in this film, the the witch um, has become. I, I I call her the witch. She's the she's that, that's what she is now, and it's what everybody calls her. But um, it's a uh, you know Lian Ni Chang. She has um, been completely sort of. She's completely morphed into a a leader of a de- of a death cult, just like the one that she ran away from in the last movie, which is wonderful. And so that that's why I kind of would like would like to talk about epics and the rules of kung fu a little bit because what I love and the reason I watch this movie mouth open just eyes wide just agog and the wonderfulness to me is is just how big these themes are you know the two great lovers separated by great misunderstandings the one lover his love so powerful that he can withstand a 10-year blizzard guarding a flower he hopes will renew the goodness of his his uh, former fiance, who is now a death cult, which killing men all over China in the name of womanhood, you know that's that's big. I mean, that's like that's like I know I keep talking about Marvel comics. That's like X Men big, you know. And I I just sort of love the giant stage that that this is sitting. Does anybody get that? Yeah. Or, or am no, I, yeah. I'm I'm with I mean, you, and I think that that happens. You know, a lot of novels I, we talked about last time. A lot of novels, a lot of comic books would have these huge themes. Lot lots of characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, something that I that are it's in common throughout. Uh, you know, the wuxia uh, genre uh, across you know across media, across mm-hmm. comics, across novels, uh, and certainly we only get in. Usually it's so big that when you get a movie, you only get like a sliver of it. Yes. Because, and, and that's, that's happens a lot. Unless you can do a mini series, you only get a sliver of, you know, you'll, like I said before, you'll, you'll see some note and it's like, oh, this takes place in book three. Yeah. Because that seemed like the best place to start a movie. Yeah. Because there was a buildup in the previous ones and we didn't want to film the, the prologue basically. Right. 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 And so these yeah. themes that you know there's different rules like i mean every wuxia film and it, it's different even between uh like shaw brothers uh golden harvest etc where you you tend to get in and throughout years as well because well what do you mean you know, by that like for instance you know in a if i think of a shaw brothers kung fu movie a kung fu hero is sort of recognized by the you know he'll roll into town the guy who serves noodles will see that he is essentially a gunslinger and go right. oh i'm glad you're here there's bad dudes who have taken over the brothels and and they need somebody to the people need somebody to protect them you know they can tell that he's a good guy just, well, just something about pop, it <laughs> yeah popularity changes as well too right because there's a whole era of kind of supernatural shaw stuff right mm. so but in general you know, you tend to see uh, earlier on, you tend to see more grounded stuff, even though like five venoms isn't necessarily grounded in, you know, it's not a Taekwondo match in the Olympics, right? Right. It's got a guy who's invincible unless you hit a certain thing and another guy can fly through the air and another guy can stick to wall, right? Right. (laughs) Or or all the different, you know, ninjas in uh, some of them or um, all of the crazy weaponry that's in Kid with the Golden Arm. Yes. But in this era with like a wuxia film like Fire with White Hair, you'll tend to have a lot more supernatural things going on. Mm. And, you know, we talked a little bit, you were talking about, you know, we have a thing where, hey, don't use your martial arts or the poison will get you. It's more about, it's like, it's more, it's more like your doctor telling you, hey, you know, you have this heart condition, don't go out and jog a marathon. Right. And and so this will go through your body. If you exert yourself in the way a true martial artist would, you're, it'll cause your blood gonna, to disseminate yeah. faster. 
right inside inside your butt and and as we talked about the rule the physical rules of kung fu in these are that you have that those who practice kung fu are almost like a different it's not that they're a different race but it's you know that they may as well to to drew's point about vampires they may as well be vampires they are they are akin to humans but they they can you know well they're tall buildings in a single bound and and they have they have honest to god superpowers well there's there's an innate it's interesting too because some people are just some people are have the skills right yeah and other people train but there's usually a combo um the whole the usually the importance is on i've trained enough from an early age that i'm so in tune with you know or chief or in some places you know different different names i'm, I'm but, satisfied to call it she and even but, but this, basically this i'm so in tune with these forces that um i can do superhuman things because i'm in tune with these and that tends to be it's not it's not necessarily although there's some where you're like hey this this uh person was born with such an innate ability that they are godlike mm -hmm. right yeah but there it's tends to be like if you uh push yourself in this way maybe you won't be godlike like the the person who was just born to be that that godlike being or it's in the in the martial arts world yeah um but that will often you'll often see movies where that'll trump you know a person sticking to it and really focusing on their uh martial arts is better and you know is going to be more successful than someone who is naturally really good but then lets it slide because for whatever reason well it's pedagogy i mean that's and so uh, it's it's you know that training and that uh you know force of will is often you'll see you often see somebody too like a <clears throat> like a villain mm -hmm. who trains or maybe there's one where like a villain gets poisoned and he goes well or, or loses his um, invulnerability. He says, well, yes. I have to spend X amount of time meditating and training to get this back. Yes. And and it's that kind of stuff that, that's really, you know, well, that, those that, are the it, rules. In the United States, that's what, that was the idea with Rocky. Nobody's going to put their their sympathy with the person who is innately better. So Rocky is just a big dumb lug, and but he wants to fight. He wants to fight for real, and so he's going to fight. You know, even though right. he knows that Apollo Creed's going to bash his ass. You know, and um, that's how that's 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 how heroes work. I'm sure there are differences in the rules of these Chinese movies probably having more to do with how you relate to the group. You know, groups are very important in these two films. Everybody, you. you even though even though Cho Yi Hong goes and, and sits on a mountain for 10 years, before he goes off by himself to do his penance or whatever he's going to think of that as, um, he is constantly surrounded by by friends and elders and people he has duties to. Which is now the same. The same is true now for his, um, his nephew. His nephew. And in this movie, just three months later... This movie echoes all of that. You have a new generation of, of, of characters and they're echoing all the themes of the original one. You have, you have our, uh, you know, the nephew, um, uh, what's, I'm sorry, what's the name of the, of the nephew? It's uh, uh, Fung, I guess. And sure. he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, uh, it's Kit. Is, they call him Kit. Cause I think, remember how that the last, the surname is the first name. So everybody calls him Kit. Cause that's they call him Kit. And, and uh, he is sort of the inheritor of Cho Yi Hung's power and ability. Everybody loves him. He is in love with a beautiful girl named, we'll call her Lyra. Um, and she, even though it's liar, but that doesn't work in English. So whatever. Anyway, uh, and they're betrothed and everybody's sort of having a good time. It's echoing all those themes of the first one. There's even another woman who's in love with Kit in the same way that there was somebody else who was in love with Cho Yi Hung. It is, it, it's, it, it kind of makes you feel good watching it because you're going, oh, wow, I'm seeing the same story repeat. And instead of going, oh, this is just repeating itself. Instead, it's more more like I'm enjoying seeing the echoes of the of the same the same story again. What is the name of the did you call her Moon? The, the character Yeah, Moon who... is the is the kind of cool gender bendy one that's in love with uh... gender bendy is a good way to put her because she wears you know she wears these these pants and she smokes a, a sort of you know obviously you know just hand rolled cigarette all the time yeah, but... and she's yeah, Tough. but the grandma's always like the you know the all the seniors always tell like you shouldn't dress like a shouldn't dress like a man. More, you should on. be more ladylike. That's yeah. what I always used to get when I was a kid. Yeah, not very ladylike. <laughs>
<laughs> um, you were very ladylike. You looked like a, a Nagel painting. I yeah, but my I'd... mom. Thank you, but my mom was a model, so it's never you're never ladylike enough for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, boy, have you ever heard any, in a more dated reference than "you looked like a Nagel painting"? That's sort of that's sort of our <laughs> high school experience in like, like, yeah. Right, right there was a sort of what, and reference. then a, a really hilarious flashback ensued that we cut out of this entire. entire I was talking episode. about you, Jason. Uh, to excuse the um, the the, the, the digression, the, the digression. Thank you. That's the word. <laughs> I was talking about you at the um, at the ladies' potluck, hmm. and I was saying because we cause were talking about the various ways that people communicate, and somebody was like, "Oh, we had blah blah blah," and I'm like, "Oh, my husband wrote me actual letters on paper." and fold them and put them in envelopes and then put song quotes on the outside. And they're all like, Oh, do you still have those? That's so cute. Do you, <laughs> you have can tell them? that I was one of the older, of course I do. Uh, you can tell that I was one of the older, um, older people in the group. Cause everybody was Goodness like, gracious. not, uh, or at least nobody had dated their spouse in high school, except for me. Wow. <laughs> Who was my age. <laughs> well, that's but I was I'm, one of the older ones. I'm glad that you have the letters. That's, uh, yeah. that's, that's nice. Um, gosh. So, uh, all right, I, I I would like to talk about these um, a, a couple of the themes that came up because this is a really interesting one. The question of um, female assassins, the lesbian vampire thing, the whole homoerotic undercurrent running through the men I see one, I kill one death cult. Um, I would might we really take on even it. call it under yeah. undercurrent. Well, right, as, as somebody it's pointed pretty out, pretty overt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was a uh, Rizzoli and Isles that they were talking about that detective show and they were saying, you know, the lesbian undertones are sometimes not so much undertones in this movie. And it's yes. Uh, themes. I would call them themes. Themes. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, the question is, as Drew was pointing out, are they intended to appall the audience and make them go? No, I don't think so, because. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like the guys have a lot of of homoerotic stuff going on too with their and and they're the quote unquote good guys or whatever. Um, they also have a lot of that, you know. And then there's um the women. It's very much uh, it's meant to be titillating. It's, I don't think it's meant to mean like oh, but they're so in, evil. They're kind of getting almost getting it on. It's like no, I just feel like it was supposed to be titillating. Even even in the kind of movies I'm talking about like the 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 queer stuff is always meant to be titillating and sort of a forbidden fruit i mean Mm. like think about think about you know ingrid pitt in the the vampire lovers and they literally take this girl from a heteronormative on on her wedding night Mm -hmm. they literally take her and they convert her into one of one of them with this very yeah i I see what you mean but i think that's more i think that's more misogynistic than it is homophobic because i really feel like um the guys are also super gay (laughs) just the way they act so i don't feel i I feel like that was more about like misogyny than but But it is titillating to his point yeah the whole and the whole mission of the guys Again, whether this was intended or not, because mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm I'm looking at this from the lens of a Western horror fan who has seen, you know, like a lot of, you know, the, the sort of films that were that I'm referring to. Um, the whole mission of the guys is to restore a yeah. sort of heteronormative yes. order. And even the women who are are, you know, as you said, kind of gender bendy, they're still on board with that mission. And in fact, you have like the yes. grandmother character at one point, uh lambasting uh the the I, I think his name was Green. Yes. Um for being too sick for not being masculine enough yeah and this is something like spend know, a couple of years toughening up or something and it'll work yeah out yeah and i that's the thing i, I there is a, a very much like hey let's let you know like you know we want to titillate you with with queerness but you know like the on the surface level like the heroes are all about uh restoring uh you know hetero heteronormative yeah relations and whatever yeah and again i'm not even saying that and i'm not even saying that that was even necessarily intentional Mm. on the part but i feel you i i hear what you're saying i agree i think you're right that that, i think it is uh, intentional i think it's ever thus i mean it's thus in 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 western horror as well because 
you think of Kiss of the Vampire, very similar thing. You have uh, Jennifer who is is stolen away by the vampire cult in that. Closest thing to a Western version of this story in that one, a, a vampire cult steals this woman away on her honeymoon and get her to say nasty things about her husband. And, and it's all very sexual. However, it's not all that gay, but it's a very, it's a very like sexually dominant. Um, we're going to replace replace you kind of thing um that's a few years before vampire lovers which does a similar thing that doesn't have the cult this has both of those i you know i i think this this makes great villains i mean titill, titillating titillating villains lets you sort of indulge in the stuff that you maybe don't necessarily approve of and then see see it sort of taken away from you um, the difficulty is now you and I, we all live in a world where we don't find lesbians particularly troublesome. So uh, so well, we don't know what to make of it. It, 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 it causes to, us to have confusion. Yeah. To that ahead. point, though, I do think that, first of all, as a point of discussion, you know, storylines like this can help us grapple with the, you know, these kinds of feelings and you know grapple mm -hmm. as a, a society i don't necessarily think that it's wrong to have a story like this i but i think we it's important to to look yeah at why why the storyline is like this and yeah you know certainly you can even get to a point where like it's it's uh, you know, a parody, like, you know, we see, see that with Rocky Horror Picture Show, where they're kind of like making fun of this kind of storyline in horror. Well, also, it's complicated because even if we, we, we are, uh, you know, in theory, quote unquote, on the side of the good guys, you know, Lian Chang has been twisted by her need for revenge. Her lover, who is running the cult with her and has no other purpose in this cult, is like, can you please stop obsessing over your revenge and eventually getting back your your ex betrothed, and instead um, just kind of hang out and be a, in a magic cult with me? You know, there's and there's nothing we can tell that we are meant to sympathize with her. You know, it, I think you're 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 supposed to sympathize with the women. You brought up X Men earlier, and yeah. I, I I think that you know Mag Magneto's uh, uh, a a uh, app comparison yeah. because like you can sympathize with why they are are at this point but they right. are they are too extreme and yeah their, somebody's gonna put them down beliefs. because they're murdering yeah. people left and right yeah um, well yes. and you know hashtag not all men are right. are are scumbags yeah but, uh, although they do seem to pick some scumbags i mean you know to their credit you know, a lot of the people that they pick are, you know, bad dudes who have who have clearly missed. It is kind of hilarious. In a way, it's almost a folk tale. It's like, guys, do not abuse your wives because there's a, you know, um, I know you don't believe this, but in your heart of hearts, you might fear there's a witch out there who's going to come and stab you with also, her hair. Also, maybe don't abuse them because you shouldn't, and it's bad to do that. Sure. Well, that's... <laughs> Well, that's what also, folk, folk tales are about right is... <laughs> jason also though like what you're talking about is sort of an age old thing with horror fiction in that the the, the monster can be the the sort of avenger of you know the the marginalized and the in the other yes and you know we see this all the time like the victims in horror films are often assholes yeah. that's right um so, well said you know wow I, bam Good one, Drew. Yes. I have was... my moments. Thank uh... you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 wonderful. Um, all right. So uh, I, I, another thing that I that I, I wanted to uh talk about. I mean, unless unless there's more to hit on that, I wanted to get on to the question of um why, you know, what like like uh what why has there not been a remake of this? There has been, by the way, Tony. To your point about maybe it'd be better as a big mini series, there there was a 2012 television series which I believe right. yeah, yeah. had a beginning and an end. Now I don't know how many episodes it is or how long it is, but since the reviews on it say that it has nothing to do with with the um, the book, that leads me to think that it probably is more based on the movie. And right, and I knew the existence. What I was, yeah, definitely. You know, I, that's why I kind of prefaced it. Like, it would have been interesting to have a 1993. Yeah, I, I wonder what that's like. I mean, I'd really love to know. You know, is, is yeah, it I cool? need to. I've been meaning to kind of hunt it down for a while because I, yeah. I, 
you know, I like the movies, even though, like I said, I'm not as as enamored with two. Yeah. I I generally like it and the cast, and so I would love to. See, I I just haven't tracked down the miniseries for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to see what the character looks like. I want to know if she has prehensile hair in the because it's a TV series, so I have no idea like like how hardcore the. And 2012, so you know, we if they wanted to, they could up the effects. I still yes. love. I mean, I I love what they did with the practical effects in, in this film and the way they do it. Sure. Yeah, um, I I love the effects too. I agree with you. Even the hair thing, like the fact at the and at the end when she pierces, um, when when uh, Cho, when. Uh, show comes back yeah um yeah. and she pierces him with all the the hair uh, arrows i would call them i guess uh it's fascinating i'm just i'm looking at it going that is an amazing effect it looks so cool and weird yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh martial arts based on for example like rolling up a, a cloth and turning it into a spear yeah mm-hmm. like a slash because you can channel like you turn this uh, a, a soft material into a hard material or vice right. versa depending on what you yeah you know, they that, do a lot of cutting with soft with what i would consider soft materials yeah um and then cool. of course yeah the flying is awesome i love the flying every time it's a, it's a good point that the the way this ends you have this. You have the uh, the good guys, so called, do a raid on the on the death cult, and it's just like any raid in any movie you ever saw. They they start picking people off. The bizarre thing is the death cult is made up all of, of women, right? So it means that as they make their way through this palace, they are killing just a whole bunch of women one after the other, which is a bizarre sight. I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just really, it is, it is quite strange. And, <laughs> and one of the martial arts isn't even that. It's just, Hey, I know how to make explosives. Yes. Right. <laughs> that guy can make dynamite. <laughs> that guy he can is. make dynamite and he can blow people up. Yes. You know, but the, the, the cultists, you know, acquit themselves really well, but eventually we're down to, um, Oh, I- I have to say before you get to the the, uh, the, the end, the, when yeah. the grandmother catches the arrows in her teeth, oh my god, how badass was that? <laughs> yes, I was like, so that good. is so cool. Yeah. she's so <laughs> awesome. It's, she's a great. Yeah, she's um, great. It's, yeah, I love it's I love all that business. That she, like, go ahead, Drew. Uh, it's funny how like that's how they introduce the grandmother, but like for the rest <laughs> of the movie, she's like, oh, I'm useless. I'm useless. I'm useless. And I'm like, you weren't useless when you you caught, caught some some arrows, arrows your with your teeth, teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and i think it's more of her trying to say oh no you the young people it, it's your time uh because she's there to help them i mean she's the one who does all the logistics right and yeah. clearly she's a badass because she's a senior member of uh this martial arts society world of martial arts um and so so yeah i think that's just to show that she is amazing but yeah. The, the truth is she's there to lead them more than help more than push forward. And yes. I think also you'll see, you'll see this kind of trope where there may be an older martial artist who is incredibly badass, but knows that the youth are even more talented. And once they reach her, you know, if they reached her age, yeah. they would be, you know, unstoppable. So it's kind of this trope, but it's also, I mean, it makes for a great, you know, mixture of uh, young and old and, you know, it gives some, he gives us somebody to say, hey, Moon, you know, wouldn't you like to make your grandma proud kind of thing? Yeah. Well, it also serves to to repeat for the audience, for those of us watching, certain certain lessons that we're supposed to be sort of absorbing, such as there are times when you're supposed to when you're supposed to take new roles instead of the old roles that you took, you know, you're, you're, and, and you're supposed to become a mentor and it's somebody else's and story she's know? also more trusted than some of the older elders like there's the one guy who's just like we gotta attack and let's just do everything like he's yeah you know, clearly his focus is on you know punitive measures and and kind of rash and untrusting of the uh the youth of today perhaps because he's yeah. also you know he's been burned by you know we we let them do what they want and look now we have a witch <laughs> and a cult <laughs> and you know we can't let this happen we gotta we gotta strike now or else there's Except always the cult is like really badass and they do not take yeah. prisoners yes i mean there's always in in all of these stories there's always a a wharf style character whose advice is not really to be listened to generally you know because he always is too too interested in in attacking first um i i i love these tropes they're 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 pretty cool um 
but yeah, when they when they get to basically, it, it's a, it's a very strange moment because they manage to sort of chew their way to the witch, taking all kinds of casualties, and then the witch sort of um, uh, I, I I can't remember how exactly this works, but the witch the they're not going to get the witch. The, the the witch winds up being she's going to win except for that at the last minute um wonderfully Cho Yi Hong just appears you know outside because he has returned and oh my so god they was, have... that was so well done because he just appears it's like the coolest yes appar- you know appar- apparition he's just so sexy and just awesome with his flowy hair <laughs> it's like, it's, you know. it's fantastic <laughs> you know and I, and I I always for years I was always like why aren't West Western films ripping all the stuff off like left and right, you know, and then slowly it started to because you had directors like John Woo just come and start directing in the United States. And so so then you started to see some of these just rule of cool stuff amped up. Well, and apparently um, Leon, Leon is uh, the inspiration for Xena Warrior Princess. Really? That is cool. That's well, really neat. Also, Jason, what's interesting is they'll go and time and time again, somebody will go, hey, you did these awesome movies in Hong Kong. Yeah. Like, come to Hollywood, make some movies. And then, but then they go, well, that doesn't really work. You got to make it Hollywood style. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just, it's not just Hong Kong. It's like all over. Yeah. Where you'll, you'll court someone who has yeah. a specific style and then just chop and chop and chop until you only get like, well, I guess this has a lot of doves in it. Yeah. You know, I was right. listening to um, the smart less, <laughs> the smart less podcast. And it was, they were interviewing Matt Damon. I think it was smart less or maybe it was, maybe it was WTF. Anyway, what are the podcasts? I was interviewing Matt Damon and he had said he'd wanted to work. Uh, he went to like Asia. I'm probably getting the story wrong, but anyway, he went to Asia because he wanted to work with this one director and he was like so excited. And then it went terribly because they wanted to make it hot. Hollywood. So all of the choices they were making to make it more Hollywood were terrible choices. <laughs> so yeah, it was like the happen. whole point I mean, of him doing that. Yeah, it, it happens. Works. You know, I, I, have a, I have a friend who's an artist who does this really awesome, uh, you know, hybrid. He worked, you know, he worked for big two companies here and then he moved to Japan. He has a really great kind of, you know, manga influence style. And he would go to companies and they go, yeah, you get it, man. You're one of the few Americans who really gets manga style. Now, can mm-hmm. you draw more like Marvel? Because you're American. And he's like, why Why didn't you hire me? Like, <laughs> I mean, he's an amazing artist. That's the, that's the funny question is why hire the guy? <laughs> well, I mean, he's, and it's, it's, it's tough move, in Japan. You know? yeah. It's tough in Japan because uh, for manga because they don't need American artists really unless you're doing so it was it was kind of a misunderstanding slash wasn't exactly like luring him or take advantage um but his is i think his most successful comic other than stuff he's done for big two is a uh a comic called uh wayward uh where with jim zub and you know it's kind of a buffy uh in japan which wayward is really good steven's a good friend but it was all you know we talk and he's like yeah you know i i would go to these companies and and i get it because they're like hey we cool we hired i mean he's he's a really good artist so even getting even getting an audience and a major manga publisher yeah again because they don't need uh, anybody from the west to, to draw you know like they've got that, that is filled. So he would have these high level meetings and he was watching, you know, other uh, people come in and try to pitch their books and just leave crying because they were so harsh. So he was having a different discussion, uh, you know, a higher level discussion, but it still sometimes boiled down to like, yeah, you know, we have these, we have, we have that, but like, can you give us a little bit more of that Marvel? <laughs> like oh man and he did it of course i mean he's a professional right he's gonna do what he's gonna do but that that whole thing of look the it's you know goose the golden egg kind of thing like did you really why did you hire me if you're just gonna take it and you know filter it so many through so many levels that it's not even the same thing anymore you know yeah and that's a shame and that's what i think you know we luckily we've seen it's weird too because we've seen an increase in uh people taking that aesthetic because filmmakers grew up on martial arts movies and uh, you know stuff like high quality. You didn't have to find bootlegs anymore, right? Because when we right. were growing up, like, maybe you'll find a VHS of um, Five Deadly Venoms or something like that, or maybe you'll catch it on Kung Fu Theater. Whereas now it you might just be stream it. Scan, you yeah, know, like uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and now you know you can. It's 
as it became more accessible in the age of DVD and uh, even VCD was a big game changer for a lot of people, which was CD compressed onto a CD movies. And and the advantage was you could just play them anywhere on any CD player, you see ROM. So oftentimes they're region freaks, it's just CD. Um, there's some region stuff, but anyway, uh, but you'll see, and some people are able to get why some things are cool and and have that be a deep you know you go oh i can see that person really got it and some people will take just the superficial elements and go well here's some wire work and you know finding the people who really get it and can incorporate that or who also hire the choreographers that that's a big difference yeah. like being able to hire the right fight choreographer and also have somebody who can do cinematography where if you want to mimic certain styles of combat you might you'll you're going to cut less perhaps like yes. if you wanted to if you wanted to do what felt like a shaw brothers early uh, 80 shaw brothers or the late 70s you're going to have a lot less cuts yeah um yeah and so some people are better at that than others but i you know i'm always wary i mean personally as a fan of all of this i'm a little wary of um you know, when it's like, oh, we're going to take this person, we're going to bring him to Hollywood. Some some film companies get it and others want the most superficial. Yeah. Like, the executives just don't understand. Oh, I heard a lot, made a lot of money. Just give us the thing. Yeah. Like, well, you've excised, you've cut out all the parts that make, that made it make money. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. But then, you know, we also have, you know, cool stylized stuff like John Wick, which incorporates, you know, some of those fights really incorporate the stuff that we dig. I mean, there's, that's just one example. That's some, what I use that because that's a recent example of like, hey, that looks really cool. No, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah, John, and, and actually the Wick movies really do um, sort of absorb the whole notion of let's set up a world that follows its own bonkers uh, rules of people with nearly superhuman power that that are kind of existing outside of our world you know right. they're special people with special powers and special rules and that's pretty great it's it's heavily heavily influenced by by kung fu it just happens to be gun kata you know but right well there's still... there's certain parts that are you know hand to hand but it, it i mean yeah. it does owe a lot more to don Wu. Mm like the killer and you know yeah then then it does to a wuxia film but there's enough elements that it feels you know you'll see it and like oh that's cool yeah and that's not that's that's one of the more recent ones there's tons of there's people doing it right but it's you don't always see that well what i wonder is i what i was trying to figure out is if you were to make a a westernized this is a thought experiment okay and it might be terrible but if you were making a westernized remake you know like they made city of angels which was a not really particularly popular uh remake of um wings of desire right mm -hmm. and you know which was just so 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 uh Vim vendors and it was turned into what it was turned. I don't even remember who made that. I'm sure maybe it was a wonderful was, director. I, I can't it was remember. Nicolas Cage. So it was Nicolas sorry. Cage was the star. Nicolas Cage <laughs> and Meg Ryan. Um, and so you could do that here. You go, hey, what if we take the concept? You know, the the two lovers. They're separated. They have magic powers. The thing is, there's so much mumbo jumbo that it would be almost impossible to do it as a as an American film. Except that in the last seven or eight years, we live in the world of superheroes. So maybe in the context of superheroes, you could do it. Oh, I have but lots if, of ways. I, if if somebody said like this has to be Hollywood as Hollywood can be, mm -hmm. like. I have a bunch of ideas on how you could do that. Oh, really? So we're going to cut all, yeah. But, you know, would that be as good or better? I think, yeah. you know, the problem is that that I think if you did that, let's just not say that we're it's a remake per se, right? right? Let's, no, you're you right. Know, you do just like DNA John Wick. It because so often yeah. people get into that trap. Like, well, we have to use the license because we get the license. Like, well, if you had just said it was, you know, influenced by or, yeah, you know, inspired by inspired by then you don't get that direct comparison yes like you know i was just thinking i feel this way about the, la the the new robocop like mm. i thought it was a decent film but me personally had, loving the original robocop like yeah it didn't need to be called robocop right in in that way yeah. i mean I, I, there, there's so many similarities i mean it's definitely a remake but like it was hard to get it's hard it was hard for me as a fan to get past what i kind of wanted or expected i mean I, we're far I hear afield you, right? of, no, of our feel discussion like... of probably why here but no but no I... but that's exactly right like like think about that if you had done robocop remake and just called it you know something like 
like uh, I, I don't know shell just giving it a random name right? right and people go oh this is heavily influenced by robocop you're right they would they would respect it more on its own rather than constantly going well the first movie was a political film and this is this seems to be more like a a, a a thriller of its own you know with different lessons and that's a that's a complicated and confusing conversation to get into and it ruins your experience of just watching robocop um yeah and I'm not saying that that, and I, I like a lot of that film, but that's, I don't know. I guess if I really knew all this stuff, I would be a multimillionaire Hollywood producer or, or director, right? But I, I have my own ideas about what really would, as a fan, you know, but the, too often they, well, yeah, but you're a fan. You're not the person who's, mm. you're not a million fans. You're one fan. Why should I listen to you? I don't know. I don't have the good solve for that. But I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the, you know, um, I suspect that you're selling yourself short in that because. Well, and it doesn't like, matter because nobody's asking us to make a new movie, a new version right. of this movie. Um, but we should probably move okay, on. Okay. Yes. So. Uh, one thing I definitely want to do is go is see the some other versions of this because there is of course as we mentioned there's a 2012 television series called Bride with White Hair specifically called that but there's other versions of this story out there uh, there's a 1980 film called White Hair Devil Lady um, there's a 2014 movie called The White Haired Witch of the Lunar Kingdom and and that's a that's a, a Wuxia film. There, there have been one, two, three, four, five television series, including the 2012 version that we talked about. So this is a story that people have gone back to again and again. And I can't begin to tell you if if you watched, if you sat down and said, you know, this month I'm going to watch every version of Bride with White Hair out there. That sounds, first of all, like a really fun month. But I can't tell you if if a lot of it would be great or disappointing or or what. So, um, man, we're not that kind of show, by the way. We don't like watch every version of something. But how cool would that be? I mean, I would, I would love Some, to see. Sometimes all of that. we do. We we have at times, yeah. you know. Yeah. We've seen many, many versions of Dracula, and there's still many to go. But uh, we've done every version of Carrie. That's for true. What it's worth. That's very true. Yes, the the uh, poster, by the way, for the 2014 um, one, which is again called the White Haired Witch of Lunar Kingdom uh it looks great it looks very epic so i've i have no idea it, it it could be awesome i'm gonna have to like search and see if it's on if it's on youtube anywhere or something like that um so anyway yeah that with with all of the streaming services at our disposal it's very possible that we can get our hands on that uh let's get our final thoughts on this and and i hope that people have been able to get kind of a sense of what the plot of this movie is um i know that i know that we haven't traditionally we haven't gone straight through it the way we sometimes do but um because this is the second part of really the same movie that's just cut into two pieces uh i i kind of feel like it's not completely necessary but um Let's get our final thoughts. It was Drew, Tony, Julia, and then I'll go. Drew, um, uh, did you enjoy this this trip into the world of Bride with White Hair? Yeah, um, they're interesting films. Um, it's been a minute since I've seen the first one, and uh, it, it definitely got me. Both of them got me thinking about how they they relate into you know Western, mm. the you know horror films, which I. Th- is probably the way a lot of our listeners will, yes, will come at sure. it as well. And I think um, they qualify, by the way. Yeah, not for nothing, but I, I really do believe that there's there's definitely some here. horror ish elements, but it, it, the gore, the gore, levels of gore, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, well, and but, the monster. Uh, I mean, she is a monster. The way she. Oh yeah, her. totally. Yeah, no, no doubt. Like this is this is a, a kind of of monster movie. Um, and I, I definitely thought that aspect was more on display in this, like, uh, because we, we got more of the title character as the title character. Um, I, although that being said, I, I do think in terms of actual artistic filmmaking, I think it, it might be a bit of a step down. That being said, I do think you will probably generate a, the, the most personal satisfaction out of these two films is if you watch them very closely together because yeah. 
it's it's all one very long story so uh yeah i enjoyed it and uh you know and i enjoyed conver the conversation about it fun thank you tony what about you yeah i mean i I like this movie. I like it. I haven't watched this time. Like I said, I liked it. I didn't enjoy it as much as the first one. I think the first one has a slightly more epic feel, even though this has, you know, more straight martial arts and, um, you know, a body count that's just crazed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is not kind to, to heroes and villains alike. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, exceptionally tragic in that way. Uh, it's got a really expansive cast um, comparatively, uh, you know, lots of more people coming in and um, there's, you know, they do a really good job of raising the stakes. You know, I, I, I kind of do regret we didn't talk a little bit more about the martial arts involved and, you know, mm -hmm. more of the characters, but I think watching them back to back is definitely, or are close um, is definitely worth your time. Uh, I wish it had kept that kind of forward pace, mm -hmm. you know, um, and again, that's why I said I would like to have seen this be a miniseries. Like, yeah. take this, and you know, that's not to say any of the other versions are, are bad or that, you know, I just, I like the way the first one's filmed. I would have liked to have seen that team take that movie and make it a miniseries. That would have been excellent. Um, I, you know, I, I do enjoy this one, but I prefer the flavor of the first one in comparison uh but you know you want to see a good wuxia film with uh lots of gore and you know truly epic i mean I, I think even the love story is is more epic in that way in the way it's presented in the first one as well mm -hmm. um but who doesn't want you know the guy to save it's it's you know now that i think about it and again I, I hope i don't want my opening thoughts to go my closing thoughts to go too long no no but in in what drew was talking about you know it does, there's a lot to be said if you wanted to just take this, these two movies and especially the second one, and you could write some really good papers on gender studies mm. in this because you want, you do want the hero to save his bride, but also in a society where, you know, maybe she's not as good at martial arts and she's going to say, oh, look, it's the hero guy's bride. Good thing they're married. Oh, make lots of kids because everybody else in the eight clans was killed. Yeah. That, and that's the whole point. Like, well, I, you know, he's not so great, but I guess if he'll make his kids so that we can have more martial arts kids, you know, there, there's a lot, you could write a lot about that yeah and you know who's truly the villain here is is it society right um so the, there, there's a lot to it in the subtext of the writing that is perhaps in some ways even more interesting than the way i what i consider about the you know the way the martial arts sections mm. are filmed the choreography and you know how how much blur there is and how how it's shot um there's other movies i prefer over this but it, but it's it's always interesting to look at right like there's oh, uh, there's no yeah there's no time where you're kind of oh this is boring <laughs> there's always something visually interesting and that's pretty great so um i should mention by the way that the the newer version, White Haired Wit. So this this movie is available for free on Prime, and that's how we watched it. There's a newer version, White Haired Witch, from 2015, and that one, um, you know, which stars uh, Fon Bingbing and some others, uh, that's available on Blu-ray on Amazon. So it is available in the United States, which which rocks. Uh, Julia, what are your final thoughts? So I think part of the reason why this movie is um, is really the part, second part of one long movie is because you know you're talking about the um tony was talking about the uh the love story of the first one but this is the, lo the that love story is comes through to this one too because the whole idea the whole thing is that the witch is is the lover of cho who has been spending 10 years you know watching over this flower so that he can heal her so that's still the even though there's a another love story as well um of the nephew you know that's still um a really important part of the of the story Mm -hmm. And so I like that it comes back around to it. It's heartbreaking that after he sits and watches this flower for 10 years, the flower gets destroyed. In fire. Yes. I was like, that's a bummer. But, you know, whatever. I got the point was that, um, you know, the point was that she was so moved that he would do this thing. But um, anyway, so that was all kind of very interesting and very tragic. There was a lot, it was very Shakespearean in a lot of ways, this story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I kept thinking that as we were, as we were watching it. So there's some neat, um, yeah, there's, 
some neat story elements. There's some uh, neat themes. Like I said, um, I, I really like how it looks visually. It's beautiful. So uh, I definitely think it's um, it was an interesting uh, couple of films to to watch. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad I would not have ever watched them if it weren't for the podcast, as is often the case. Every time there's like a horror movie that Jason's like, do you want to watch this? I'm like, only if it's for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but then usually I do enjoy them. So. Um, so yeah, I think that was, it was a really, really neat uh, experience. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this because, you know, we had a wonderful time leading up to Halloween, you know, sort of bouncing around with some vintage stuff. Um, and by vintage, I mean like the, these two movies were from 1993, but we were spending our time, you know, in movies, mostly from the forties and sometimes all the way up to like 1970, um, Western. This was such a totally different vibe that it was very cool it was it was very cool to spend a, a, a couple of couple of weeks um in this wuxia world so that's uh, i and i love it i mean it, it really inspires me because wuxia world would make a great a, a great amusement park wuxia world that would be would i would great. i would go if that <laughs> should exist in hong kong it seems like or at yes. least a part of like a studio tour yes but like like toei toei studios in japan has a whole like we went and we also went on cosplay day so like oh yeah it's a whole awesome thing but they have you know here's how you make a samurai drama you know that happens uh you know every 45 minutes or something right and and all of that so well that's that's very I'm similar sure to the stunt cool. shows right it, yeah exactly it exactly yeah. I'm but, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. you no, it's a great idea. I mean, I'm just I'm I, thinking about what Wisher World would be like, and you'd have like dark rides, you know, with mm -hmm. with like you know animatronic characters. Oh gosh, that would be awesome. I yeah. I am really happy we did some Wusha stuff, but if we ever want to go back to Hong Kong mm. horror or Hong Kong Wusha crossover you know yeah i would love to hear if if our listeners are like yeah visit more of this because i mean by now they know me and they know that this is some stuff that you know we can where we're gonna fit with that um but i, mean, I think there's a lot yeah. I think there's a lot there, there's a lot out there that we could cover if when and if we want to revisit you know, oh, you know it. We could do like a month East. and a half on it and, and more. Adventures yeah. of the Spooky Kind, Mr. Vampire, um, millions sure. of Chinese ghost stories. All that. Uh, just all of it. I'd also like to hit some, um, uh, you know, uh, moving out, you know, we could, there, Bondar Waza and a few other really great Indian uh Mm -hmm. horror films that we've never hit on so there's, there's oh there's, there's a there's a couple um that are really great uh that we could do oh like absolutely. i could i could see people um really digging into so yeah if we if we visit if we go that that would be cool if we move east again um which we will which we definitely definitely will uh cool all right um i want to get and I can't wait to tell you guys what we're doing next week, um, the audience. I think th you guys know because we have a calendar now. Uh, but uh, let's get this week's endorsements other than the prehensile bride with white hair's hair. What have we been watching or reading or want to tell people about or putting out into the market yourself that you would like people to know about? Any of these things is acceptable. Um Let's start with you, Drew. Drew, what do you have to endorse for us? So one of the things that I have not quite abandoned yet is um, watching Universal horror films. And in fact, I have been going back through uh, their their Mummy movies, mm. uh, partly inspired by a relatively recent episode of the the Borgo, Borgo Pass podcast mm. on the the Mummy's Tomb, which mm -hmm. just made me want to dive into that franchise because I haven't looked at it in a year or two, um, and that's been fun. And you know, almost all of those are on Peacock, I think, for a little while longer for those who don't own them, like I do. Um, another thing is that uh, I I have been catching up on uh, the show Evil which is you know i've talked about it before it's about assessors for yeah. for the catholic church and every time i recommend this i i always say i think this show if you have not watched it 
if you are a, a fan of the X Files, I think that you would take a lot from it because yeah, Julia's has watched that, it. I mean, we, I, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, just the first. I, I, I didn't know. I watched the first few episodes only, but yeah. Okay. But uh, finally, actually, uh, something that's on Shutter that I, I watched this week um, and kind of ties into some of the stuff we talked about this episode is a documentary series called Queer Queer for Fear, mm. and it it's, it goes uh, throughout the entire history of horror films, talking about uh, you know things with gay overtones and undertones, you know, mm. gay and queer queer horror you know horror creators and you know they they spend a lot of time on uh classic horror actually so mm. i i i would highly recommend that, oh, that if you have a great. shutter account it it was it, jason i think you would really enjoy it um they they devote almost an entire entire episode to lesbian vampires um, oh i love it yeah i don't think we have shutter right now but maybe i need to get it again uh, just to watch i shutter is my ride or die uh streaming app thing like i mm-hmm. I, I i could get rid of everything else and <laughs> i i use shut i use shutter probably more than than anything else and doc the their documentary like that they that they do periodically are a big reason why is that you know everybody does horror stuff in october but shutter does it year round and they do it really really well and uh you know so that's that's you know i think it for me now like i said i'm doing a lot of playing catch up on stuff that i because i didn't actually get to to watch as much stuff as i would have normally yeah, understood. Done, uh, yeah. in october um anyway that's all me awesome uh tony what do you have to endorse for us um i got something really cool uh the godzilla ultimate illustrated guide by graham skipper uh and in conjunction with toho so an official uh really nice hardcover like the the in fact it's embossed and it feels like kind of godzilla skin-esque the cover and i noticed it's done well enough that it's out of stock right now on amazon um you know graham skipper is somebody you might want to interview for the uh you know, side of, of uh, Castle Bridge, like the author interview. It's a really great book. Um, I've only uh, dived into it just a little bit, but, and it's got a whole page of Godzilla doing the Godzilla dance, just a <laughs> picture and not always that. I'm like, oh, after my own heart, but it just yeah. came out recently and it is a fantastic photo book. I really think it's just got yeah, and they say ultimate illustrated guy. They're not lying. Um, really great cover, really great production. I also, if you liked this movie, it's harder to find than I would like it to be. So maybe I'm, you know, it's weird for me to introduce. I, I think if you dug what was going on here, I'm gonna say check out if you can, Deadful Melody mm. or Deadly Melody as it's called. Whereas uh, Bridget Lynn has a, a you know, liar zither depending on mm-hmm. you know what you want to call it uh that can she can kill people with it <laughs> it's amazing shoots out these you know martial arts explosions while she plays it oh it's awesome oh, i really deadly like, melody right got yeah. it okay it's i often see it as deadpool melody sure but uh and it looks like it's I, it was on streaming at one point. Um, I think I rented it through like Niche Flix back in the day. But uh, I need to I need to get that. And I also noticed White Haired Witch. Not only is it on Blu-ray, it's on 3D Blu-ray. Which it's like I'm I'm having to save money to to go back into the studio for Deserts of Mars. So I can't buy this right now, and that is makes me a little sad. Boo boo hoo! I can't buy something right. Like you know hey, what wait, I do. Tony? Way to go, privileged guy. But like, I look at it, I'm a collector and I'm like, oh, I should not get this, but I really want to see this movie. I really now want to see White Haired Witch of the Lunar Kingdom in 3D. Something huh? fierce. I, oh, oh, well. Maybe Christmas, maybe Santa Claus will be nice. Well, and... What I was going to say was, I, I'm in the same boat. A lot of times I'll be like, oh man, I really want to buy that DVD. But I realized, first of all, it's November now. So yeah. literally what I do is lately, I just put it on a little wish list. And like, Yeah, I'm, I'm doing know. that. Because I also like this album is not going to be <laughs> cheap, and I'm lucky. I'm I I'm lucky. I get to do these things, right? Like by no means. Um, you know, I I uh, there's times where I had to make different choices, but I did buy like a lot of cheap, you know, UHDs. I mean, the Amazon's been having crazy sales on UHDs, so I did watch uh, Lost Boys, inspired by 
Monster Movie Happy Hour. Oh, I did yeah. watch the the UHD 4K of Lost Boys. It looks really great. Oh, they, there's so much good stuff about that movie, too. Oh, man. But yeah, <laughs> that was my other endorsement, I guess, would be Lost Boys. You know, 4K Lost Boys looks great, and it's such a good movie. But um, but yeah, that's me. I think it would be great to uh, to watch the Lost Boys and then listen to the coverage of it on on our, our our friends the monster movie happy hour podcast there is a castle of horror episode on on lost boys but i can't vouch for its quality because it was like from our first year so it's it's you know we had lesser technology yeah. back then and, and so your mileage may vary on that for sure yeah i hope that i mean we we dig it so i hope that i think i'm sure we had perfectly decent fit, things to but... say about it i'm right. sure our our observations were you know certainly no less wise than those to be found in this episode but i'm just saying that the quality of sound probably yeah, probably, probably not as strong so. great but there, there's so oh, there's so much cool stuff in that movie. anyway <laughs> i'm back on wondering if there's <laughs> if wisdom is what i is what i should have leaned on <laughs> yeah i'm like i think maybe i'm more wise but i can't guarantee that in fact if anything i think over the past few years maybe i did i uh oh i i don't know i struggle with that my friend yeah that's a pre you know all those episodes also are uh, the early ones you know it's pre-pandemic so i wonder like what crazy shit we said that just no longer is just describes a different world you know um i don't know so anyway uh i yeah all that be... lamenting about yeah you know in a couple of years we'll have jetpack right <laughs> no, i don't think that was it um i yes so that that's my endorsement too is is just the lost boys and really honestly anything because Kiefer sutherland was joel schumacher's muse and so uh, you know, he's in, he's in Lost Boys and so perfectly presented by Schumacher. And then again in Flatliner is just like, uh, you know, like three years later and and uh, also very strong. So Flatliner is a really interesting movie. Yeah, which we covered that to yeah. uh, to Drew's point. We covered every Flatliners movie. So yeah, that was my my insist. I insisted on that one. So I, of course, as anybody knows who's been listening to us i am a big mcu nerd so of course i went well jason and i went to see um black panther wakanda forever immediately a first possible opportunity we had and yeah. i loved it it was beautiful moving interesting fun lots of um interesting cultural stuff with uh because they did a lot of work to tr try to be authentic in their representations of both the um you know the the African cultures, but also the like the Mayan and and uh, I don't know they they, just, they pulled from a lot of different cultures to try to create authenticity in these two kind of worlds. The Wakanda. So I just thought that was really neat, neat, neat film. Um, and then I got really into the the four episode mini series on Netflix called The Inside Man mm. with um with David Tennant and um. Uh, Stanley Tucci mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, that was really interesting and riveting I liked it a lot very fun very no I was gonna say fun again but it's not really fun neither one of them is really fun but they're just they're very uh, it, very very twisty and turny that that show is yeah um, so yeah those are my endorsements fantastic thank you uh, wonderful uh, I I think we leave it there and here's where I tell you what we're going to be watching next week I am so excited about this um, probably, probably ill-advisedly, but uh, we're going to be watching the 1969 film Horror House, also known as Haunted House of Horror, starring none other than Frankie Avalon, uh, and it's a slasher movie. Frankie and Avalon. I, yes. My mom. Um, I tell you guys, my mom saw Frankie Avalon at the airport in Dallas one time, and that's literally what she said: Frankie Avalon. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I hear that name, I always hear my mom saying it like that. It's super funny. Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, this is this is Frankie a few years after the Surf movies, and really uh, less than a decade before he would show up as the Teen Angel in Greece. Um, so it's a strange, a strange in between era for for Frankie. Um, cool movie. It'll be fun to watch, and uh, it's available streaming. So I'll I'll tell you guys where you can find it. So cool. I, I can't wait 
I will see everybody next week. Everyone out there, be wonderful to one another. We want to hear from you um, on Twitter and on Facebook. And um, uh, let us know what you think. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night.